Associated Press, CDC, more American adults hobbled by arthritis. A surprising jump in the number of Americans hobbled by arthritis may be due to obesity, health experts said Thursday. About 22% of U.S. adults have been told by a doctor that they have arthritis, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported. The statistic comes from a national telephone polling of tens of thousands of adults in 2007 through 2009. That translates to nearly 50 million people with the joint disease. It's also roughly the same percentage with arthritis as reported in a 2003-2005 study. But there was a significant jump in adults who said their joint pain or other arthritis symptoms limited their usual activities to 9.4% from 8.3%. That means more than 21 million adults have trouble climbing stairs, dressing, gardening, or doing other things, up from less than 19 million only a few years before the CDC research is estimated. Uh, would you each tell me what the research says about this? Well, the joints of the body are, get their blood supply through diffusion through joint capsule. In other words, they're indicators of disease in their early stages. And whether the disease is pro-inflammatory, and by the way, there's two types of arthritis, at least two types, and we're talking about the autoimmune condition, rheumatoid arthritis, which is not as common in other autoimmune diseases that can affect the joints, like psoriatic arthritis, which is, which, by the way, which is responsive to, nutri to nutritional protocols. And there's the more everyday arthritis called osteoarthritis, which is what you're probably referring to here, which is more like wear and tear arthritis that people get, which affects their large joints in their backs. And what I'm saying here, which was mentioned I don't, by one of you yesterday, I think it was, that, um, that the discs desiccate and shrink and dry out when, the blood, when they age prematurely and we develop arthritic changes in our body to the joints sometimes earlier than we develop those changes in the heart because these parts of the body, their blood supply is very vulnerable. So for example, let's see if we use the knee joint, for example, in the cartilage and the, that surround the knee joint, don't have, um, aren't permeated by a lot of blood vessels. The blood vessels surround the joint capsule and oxygen and nutrients go through the joint capsule and through diffusion go to the, um, supply the cartilage with nourishment. And those very fine, fragile blood vessels, a little bit of atherosclerosis, a little bit of sludging of the blood, a little bit of fatty sticking together, called rouleau formation, where the, where the blood, red blood vessels stick together like coins stacked up. You know, in other words, they, the blood vessels are so tiny that it's easy for the, these, blood, these um, joints to become deoxygenated or not properly nourished or not get the, the antioxidants and free radical fighters they need. And we get the degeneration of the joint tissue and now we get the cells that make new joint cartilage not working as fast as the cells that are destroying. We always, we're always losing some joint material and putting it back and losing, you know, there's always a repair and destruction and repair and destruction. The point is, when we're youthful, when we're vibrant, when we're healthy, we have good nutrition and good oxygenation of tissues, we fuel the regeneration process and, the, and we're, the wear and tear and everyday use is restored and report, repaired back to normal again. And when we don't do that, then we get destruction, repair, degeneration, and eats away little by little. The cartilage degenerates. We get osteophyte formation. We get the cartilage reforms itself abnormally in a low oxygen environment. It forms itself not smooth anymore. In other words, um, an excellent diet keeps us younger. It keeps us feeling better. It keeps us more emotionally positive about life and it keeps us the ability to physically enjoy our life because we maintain our youthful um, joints and mobility. muscles, mobility and ability to be active and enjoy life more when we eat properly. It's one of the, and that's why I'm, I feel so blessed to have learned about this when I was younger so I, because I could enjoy doing sports and activities with my children. I want to enjoy them with my grandchildren. I want to be able to stay physically fit and active in the later years. And that's one of the greatest benefits of eating a diet that's um, a, such a healthy diet. And we want it for our great, great, great grandchildren. Yeah, yeah. Um, what Dr. Furman just said is absolutely correct. Mobility is important. One of the issues that is often not looked at in nutrition and with nutritionists is that six out of 10 of us worldwide in the modern world are dehydrated. Uh, consistently, ever since I've been reading this stuff, uh, six out of 10 of us don't have enough water. Now, blood not going to the cartilage, 
blood not going to the joints, blood not going to the heart or the brain, whatever it may be, uh, literally is determined on how much water you drink because water is mostly, bl uh, blood is mostly water. So that's your first and foremost concern. You're, and in water, it's mostly oxygen. So to bring oxygen there, and the other thing is people ask me what the number one anti-inflammatory medicine is. It's water. Boy, do we have a lot of data, millions of studies it seems, on curcumins out of turmeric, and they're great and wonderful, but guess what? Water is actually more important than any other for anti-inflammatory concerns. Now, going back to piggyback on what I suggested, break down kidneys, even much easier than cartilage, are the three elements. Remember nitrogen? And remember uric acid and sulfuric acid? They also work a lot longer to do it, but they break down joints. And that's from meat consumption, dairy consumption, and also whole grain, 100% organic bakery goods. Flour products are highly, highly acid. You don't have as much sulfuric acid and nitrogen in it, but you have plenty of nitrogen, enough to break it down. Another big problem is fruit. People don't realize that all fruit is picked on ripened, and all unripened fruit is highly acid. And anyone that's trying to tell you that fruit ripens when it's picked prematurely doesn't know what they're talking about. There's only one fruit that ripens after it's picked, and that's a banana. In the skin, it has adequate enzymes. But my God, here in my state, Florida, we produce 50% of the orange juice in the world. So if you're in China drinking orange juice, you may possibly be drinking Florida orange juice. And what I can tell you, because I've lived here for a long time now, is they start picking juice oranges in October. They actually ripen in April. Now, can you imagine how acid that is to the body? Well, I can imagine, because about 25 years ago, I took a bone and I stuck it in unripened orange juice and watched it decay. And so it took a lot longer than it would in the human body. It took a lot younger, longer than in the human body. But there's even things that look like legal and wonderful and everyone's happy with them and fruit's great. But the truth of the matter is this contributes to osteo, rheumatoid, and every other form of arthritis. Now, I had the great privilege to find my soulmate, my wife, back in 1978, who's a co-director of Hippocrates, and as I always say, the brain's behind Hippocrates. She's quiet, so you think I'm the leader. <laughs> she was running the world's most famous center, natural center, directing it for arthritis. And unlike in your country here in the United States, the Swedish government is really pro-citizens. Isn't that amazing? They actually like the people in Sweden, and they try to help the people in Sweden, and they, they actually prefer to help citizens before corporate interest. And so the government came in and said, my, this is remarkable. You're putting people on plant-based diets and having them drink massive amounts of juices and liquid, liquids and fluid, and people are reporting they're getting well. So let's come in and do research. So the citizens paid for the research in Sweden. They spent two and a half million dollars. And the day after the study was finished, the Swedish government began to send Swedish citizens there. And in 1982, I asked, to one, of the, I asked one of the parliamentarians, why did you do that? Just to see what he would say. And he said, well, you would like to think we're nice people, and we are, but my God, it saves us lots of money. Do you know how many dollars, or krona they call it there, doctor's office visits take until the person's crippled and, and how much medicine cost? And so we've seen this clinically done both at Brendel, the clinic my wife directed, at Hippocrates, I'm sure Dr. Furman, uh, you, you weren't an expert, but you've seen arthritis, I'm sure. Anyone that changes a lifestyle and diet, and the most important thing he said was movement and exercise. Vegans who eat healthy diets, if you don't move and exercise, you could have degradation and end up with an arthritic condition too. I don't think I said that, but I'll accept it. Well, did, you want, did you want to say something? Or can I, um, oh, you go ahead. I just wanted to make two comments. Um, number one, that 
we have to make sure that we don't confuse certain issues here, that we have a preponderance of evidence to show that eating fruit protects against cancer and increases lifespan, benefits, benefits the heart, benefits the eyes, and there's even studies to show that certain fruits like berries accelerate, encourage the reversal of cancer, like squamous cell carcinoma or esophageal cancer. We have studies on that, number one. And there's a full of polyphenols that actually reduce glucose, that interfere with the absorption of glucose, and certain fruits have very low glycemic effects. So certainly a person could overeat fruit, but I don't want to put a negative blanket on all fruit, and eating fruit in general. Number two, I just wanted to give the other alternative that um, I don't agree with the idea that we need all much water either. I don't think we have science to support that theory. That, in other words, any science that shows that is done on SAD eating people, they eat a diet of processed foods, high salt, and animal products. But what if I'm eating a diet of, you know, melons and tomatoes and cucumbers and salads and sprouts and all these high um, liquid foods, and you're not eating high salt? You know, don't forget, you know, I take care of a lot of people that are coming from an American diet, a junk food eating diet, a processed food eating diet, and they go on to a, a healthy nutritarian diet, and they may lose 20 pounds in a week. 20 pounds in a week. And they're not losing fat, they're losing water weight. They're peeing out a lot of water because, number one, not just the extra salt, your body holds on to water when you're toxic. In other words, let me give you an example. A guy comes to see me, and I put him, I, years ago, he's in my guest house. And so, I'm, so he's overweight and I'm keeping him there, like you see people day in and day out. And he loses a pound a day. He loses it like 10 days, 10 pounds, 20 days, 20 pounds, 21 days, 21 pounds. And then he goes out to a vegan singles dance that night with a, uh -oh. and he has like a corn muffin and some um, pasta, macaroni, and macaroni um, pasta salad. And he comes back and he gains three pounds. He didn't eat three pounds of food. He only ate like a little bit of food. How did he gain three pounds? Well, the body's holding onto water now. And then he didn't lose the weight the next three or four days. It took him like another four or five days to get back into the detox mode again, to start losing weight again. But he wasn't losing fat then. He was losing a lot of, you know, some fat, but a lot of water. What I'm saying is as the body is flooded with nutrients, as you stop taking in all the toxins, your body doesn't need to hold on to all that water anymore. It doesn't have to dilute all the, to all the toxicity of the tissues that are inflamed that need to hold them. You know, some of that body weight people are carrying is excess water from all the junk they're eating, and you diurese a tremendous amount of water when you eat healthfully. And when you're eating a low salt, high water content diet, you don't need that much water. I mean, maybe you do in Florida, when, you, when it's so hot and you're sweating and you're outdoors Arizona, and you're exercising. You yeah, <laughs> sure, but, but, in, but if you're not, you know, if you, you know, I certainly drink a lot of water when I'm exercising, playing tennis, you know, sweating, skiing, working out in the gym, ju doing jumping, whatever it is I'm, you know, I'm eat, drinking water, but in a normal, you know, you don't need as much water as people think you need but, but if you eat healthfully and, you know. Let's not confuse the, the people. He's not saying you don't need fluid. Right. He's saying, and I completely concur with this, I'd rather have you eat the ve vegetables. Celery. Celery, incredibly high, that's, drink the juices, but if you don't get enough from that, and the point you're making is very important. An arid climate, more water. Mm -hmm. You need about a half an ounce of fluid, legal good fluid, for every one pound body weight. Now, if you're in, in an arid climate and exercising, you need probably double that. Uh, one of the first things that I would like to say is, is how disappointing it is uh, that so many of our major arthritis organizations in the world deny any connection between diet and arthritis and tell patients over and over that there are no diet changes that can be made that will be of any benefit. Because I know every single one of us has seen remarkable changes when people change diet and actually there are some fairly good studies and a number of studies that have shown that vegetarian diets and particularly vegan and raw vegan diets are extremely effective for uh, reversing many of the symptoms of arthritis. And, uh, and so we know that. And one of the things um, from an experience perspective that I've seen is that people tend to often do extraordinarily well just removing dairy and meat. Uh, those two things, but especially dairy. And I think for a lot of people, 
Uh, food sensitivities are hugely important if they're sensitive to gluten or they're sensitive to dairy, and many people are sensitive to dairy. This can make arthritis a whole lot worse. And I'll tell you, from again, from a personal perspective, just my own experience, and I have in my family um, a lot of diabetes, a lot of arthritis, a lot of these chronic diseases, and by the time people in my family reach my age, I'm 56 years old, um, they, <laughs> they have these diseases already, and I'll tell you, I'm at 56 years of age, I don't feel any different than I did when I was 25. I, I can still run as fast, jump as fast, I can still stand on my head and do handstands and whatever, I really don't feel any different. And I think that should be the norm uh, instead of the other way around. And so we have to, you know, we have to recognize that when we take foods and we strip them of, of everything of value to human health, you know, so you take, um, whether it's a grain or whatever it is, and we're processing them to death, we remove everything of value. And who eats a bowl of flour? Nobody. Before you eat the flour, you add a bunch of garbage to it. Sugar and, and uh, you know, trans fats and colors and flavors and preservatives, and then you eat it. And we wonder why we're all sick. You know, we've got to get off this thing of eating, you know, or destroying our food before we eat it. And the only reason we do that is because people are trying to sell a 25 cent product for 250. That's it. That's it. You know, that's the bottom line. And so we've got to recognize that. And so I think people can do incredibly well at, at reversing these kinds of inflammatory diseases by eating a less inflammatory diet, and it's not rocket science. How are we fixed for time, Steve? Go ahead. So one of the things we're gonna talk about tomorrow uh, is the gut as gateway to chronic disease, and one of those gateways is autoimmune disease or uh, any disease that involves inflammation. And we'll learn that uh, the intestinal tract, particularly the lower half of it, the colon, is charged with recycling water, so you don't have to drink so much, but not recycling waste. And if you do not have the right bacteria, which then are, are present because you eat the right food, and if those bacteria don't digest the right food, particularly fiber, then you don't have the butyrate or the butyric acid, which is a fuel for those lining cells that are able to recycle water but not recycle waste. And if you recycle waste, then the immune system, which lines the GI tract, will react because it thinks that it's seeing something foreign, and what it is seeing is something that it never should have seen. <laughs> and so uh, getting the gut healthy so that it's not leaky and getting the bacteria helpful rather than harmful and getting the food in that feeds all of that is something that we'll talk about when we talk about the gut as gateway uh, to chronic disease. Uh, so uh, that will be, the, I was thinking of the gluten that you mentioned and, and w w people that are reversing rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of times they're just taking away gluten right. as the first step. So uh, we'll try and make sense of all that tomorrow.